Uh, good morning. Um, amongst other things, there's a slight trepidation, as I suspect, along with the person coming straight after me, we are separating you between lunch, so that adds to my desire to be brief. Um, I also should say, I had absolutely no idea there was going to be so many people here. I thought it would be to a rather small group talking about some of the finer points of antimicrobial resistance. So. <laughs> Uh, I thought I would, and, I, and in that regard, and because of life has been slightly chaotic the past few days, uh, I have not prepared a formal speech, so I shall say a few things and uh, commit to finishing on time. I might take a question or two. I'm not sure whether that's what I was supposed to do, but um, I will. So the first thing I I'd actually, in view of the circumstances in which we meet, I thought I would emphasize is the main reason why I am a minister in the government, at least at the moment, um, is uh, I am commercial secretary to the Treasury uh, and I have a number of tasks, two of which uh, I think are, are relevant for, for this audience. Uh, actually, no, three. Uh, I'll tell you all four. Uh, the fourth is I'm, I'm here to be uh, uh, heavily involved in the infrastructure uh, goals and ambitions uh, of the country and helping delivery of them. But the three that are, are particularly relevant here in addition to that is I have some responsibility for trying to pursue policies to boost our productivity and obviously science and research uh, are right at the core of that and uh, let's just say that the challenges we face in that area are probably heightened by as a result of what we have decided in the past week. Uh, the second thing is uh, partly because I have the phrase bricks uh, plastered across my forehead, because I'm sure some of you know, I dreamt up that strange phrase nearly 16 years ago. I am heavily involved in our uh, economic dialogue uh, with China, India and others. Uh, and I think it is very important, uh, uh, it was important in any case, but it is very important in the consequences of last week that, uh, that I and others uh, reach out to try to make sure uh, our desires to have even better relations with them are even stronger than they were before. Uh, and then the other thing uh, which is uh, particularly relevant and the main thing I do uh, is I came here to help execute the Northern Powerhouse. Uh, and one can think whatever one thinks of the messages from last week, but one thing seems pretty clear to me, if that was important in my head before, it is even more important. And I want to say in particular in that regard that this Thursday, uh, a very critical moment for the Northern Powerhouse uh, is uh, an independent economic plan uh, is being launched by the Northern Leaders at the International Festival for Business in Liverpool. Uh, and it's a really important moment because that is uh, as a result of consequences of a lot of work by Northern Leaders and business and universities uh, in the North, many of you no doubt in this room I hope have been involved in, that will be taking uh, more responsibility and ownership and delivery of the Northern Powerhouse Plan so owned by the North for the North, which gives it an additional leg of substance, which means uh, it will live way beyond whatever the strange world in that we all live here in Whitehall that I have enjoyed for most of the last 13 months of this intriguing part of my life. Uh, can't play around with so long as it's being driven by the North for the North. Uh, and there are four uh, business areas which that document is going to highlight in where the north of England thinks it has a real uh, world-class value-added edge and life sciences are one of the four. Uh, and those of you that are di directly involved in that should feel uh, emboldened by that and have your own responsibility for making that uh, even clearer to the country, to Whitehall and to the rest of the world uh, as a result of what's happened the past few days. Let me now turn for the rest of my uh, comments uh, uh, about antimicrobial resistance. Uh, separately than my ministerial duties, in fact I was doing this before I was asked to do this, uh, I was asked to chair uh, an independent review into antimicrobial resistance. Let, let me do a little game here that I like to do uh, with many others. H how many people in this room have never heard of AMR? That's pretty impressive, virtually most of you. Uh, 
Three weeks before our final review, which is now about four weeks ago, I spoke at an event uh, called Wired Health UK, probably uh, 500 people in the room, probably the most technologically smart, or certainly amongst them, the most technologically smart people in health in the country. One third of that audience didn't know what antimicrobial resistance was, to my astonishment. Part of the reason why this review has, has been one of the most wonderful things I've done in my, been lucky enough to do in my professional career is to help get the message that if we don't do something about this, uh, by 2050 there will be 10 million people a year around the world dying and it will be a uh, catastrophic economic uh, consequence for the world economy. I think I saw a very brief analysis of our final review in which the highly influential Lancet uh, carried a piece saying that if uh, the world governments implement what our review uh, is recommending, it will be the single most important thing for global productivity uh, and uh, uh, global uh, health and sustainability uh, compared to anything else uh, this century. No pressure. Uh, it was very nice to see that and I accepted the role in chairing this review because I was persuaded it was that important uh, and in the spirit of what I just heard uh, in, towards the end of that last panel, very important uh, for me and have the chance this morning to highlight this. Uh, amongst the reasons why this was uh, such a thrilling experience and remains so, I hope, uh, is it demonstrated uh, Britain's soft power uh, in a spectacular way. As I have said in the occasional chances I've had to speak directly to the Prime Minister about it, the amount of praise uh, that he, by deciding to uh, make this an, an independent review with a global remit, has got from all over the world as I've gone around and uh, interacted with people uh, is, is very pleasing to hear and is at the core of how, despite the uh, challenges we have set ourselves uh, in the past week, uh, the sorts of things we've got to not lose sight of. Uh, on, uh, I'm assuming here that most people have a vague awareness of what we put in our review. Uh, if you don't, I'm sure there's a uh, way. Go on, go on the Independent Review's website. Our final review will be on there. There are 29 specific recommendations. Uh, we essentially suggest uh, if some of the big parts of that can be implemented, uh, which would cost the world about $40 billion uh, on top of whatever else it was going to do over 10 years. That is, uh, as a smart ex-hedge fund friend of mine told me, uh, if you turn that into an investment, that would be a 2,500% return relative to the cost of us not doing anything uh, to solve this problem. And he's dead right. Uh, and I am very hopeful. A lot of people have been asking me, what, what are you now going to do, given that this review has come to an end? And my answer is, uh, and they, this has been uh, re-accelerated by a result of the fun and games we're choosing to impose on ourselves, uh, ask me in October. Uh, and, that was the case before what we're now going through, but I, the reason why I said that is for twofold. Uh, because two of our recommendations are in train, and I sincerely hope, because of our issues, they will not be lost. One is for a uh, G20 deal on how to get new drugs. Uh, uh, this year in September, I think it's the 7th, 6th and 7th, very historic moment in global governance. The China Chinese are hosting this year's G20, and I have some reasonable hope that there will be an important statement within that community about how we get new drugs. In parallel with that, and on the 21st of September, I'm quite hopeful, there will be a so-called high-level uh, UN agreement uh, on other issues of antimicrobial resistance, uh, including issues about global awareness, so that more people around the world uh, are as informed as what I'm sure this audience is about what a danger it is to the world. Uh, stewardship, surveillance, and importantly, uh, reducing the inappropriate use in agriculture. Uh, it is and remains one of the most exciting things I've ever been involved in. 
It's exciting because we somehow have caught the moment and got a lot of momentum. I'm sure I don't see too many people I know individually in this room on the topic, but I'm sure there are many of you uh, that deserve credit. Uh, assuming that some of the things I've hinted at uh, go ahead, uh, there will be great opportunities that come uh, for this, including for science researchers. One of the remarkable things is how few people in science and in health science actually spend time researching antimicrobial resistance. And one of the things we are recommending is the need for more of those, uh, along with many other things. So there's a, a great flavor. Uh, a quick flavour, should I say. Uh, I don't know whether I should or shouldn't take questions, but I'm finishing before my 15 minutes is finished. Well, so you have a brief chance, if you so Well, I think inclined. we'd have just about time for a couple of questions, so, but they've got to be very, very quick. Thank you. Well. So, first of all, it's, it's really wonderful that you uh, did this review and, uh, and it has some great recommendations. But I should say, as someone who uh, worked on antibiotics and the ribosome and was involved in uh, two startup companies that tried to use this work to develop new antibiotics, that we have a serious market problem. And the problem is that uh, currently there isn't a plague. And so when uh, the plague is imminent, but it's not here yet. And so. Uh, what the problem is, is if there's a new antibiotic that works against resistant strains, the medical community very rationally wants to restrict its use to only those patients who have uh, resistant infections. Quite right. Exactly. And so the, the market for the new drugs is very limited. And also, if the antibiotic is any good, the patient is cured. In a, in a week or two, and it's not like a lifelong drug. Yeah, yeah, and this is it. why we've had a market failure. Uh, we've not had new classes of antibiotics for I, I 30 years. I, get, I know, we have and, a lot to say the, about it. Sure, but, but I've read your report, and one of your solutions is to have what is effectively a prize, uh, which is to say, we'll give a billion uh, dollars for the development, bringing to market a new antibiotic. Now, first of all, you know, we don't know how well prizes work, but I wonder if there's an ideological bias for a free market solution. Then <laughs> you must remember... I'm not sure many of the pharmaceutical companies think we have that ideological bias, well, given well, what we've suggested. I want to say that penicillin... It's interesting to hear that. But penicillin, for instance, was not a free market solution. It was in response to the war, and it was a government-based uh, initiative, which brought penicillin from the lab all the way to the market. Shall I deal with that quickly? Or? Well, quickly, and then... Yeah. I'll take another one first, then. OK, is it, listen, it will have to be the very shortest, oh, quickest, last that. question, and then you can combine the two, but we are under pressure. I'll just deal with this. In which case, do OK. Yeah. Oh. It'll be very, very quick, please, if you... Mary Siddiqui, um, US Embassy London. Um, my question is regarding what areas of science were affected deeply by Brexit? I know the space sector is relatively protected because of its relationship with the European Space Agency, agency which is not part of the EU, but what other sectors that, are deeply affected? That question's easy for me to answer. I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> On this one, uh, where I, ha I, I probably also have no idea, but I have some views. Uh, in, in our judgments, the, the demand-reducing side uh, of our recommended interventions are at least as important, if not more, than getting new drugs, uh, which, by the way, if are implemented, add, of course, to the challenges facing uh, the commercial uh, market failure challenges. Uh, amongst our uh, bold recommendations, I'd call them, is, is making it mandatory, mandatory to uh, not allow any of our doctors to give an antibiotic unless it's got what I call a Google for Doctor diagnostic by 2020. Uh, you, we do not currently have that technology, but we need to create more market incentives for the VC world in that space. And we can get whatever new drugs we want, but unless we stop treating these damn things like sweets, when have we got new drugs, we'll have resistance again. So. What you raise is a tiny part of the issue and not as important as so many people think on its own. Uh, 
One of the reasons we're recommending the G20 are the right people to focus on new drugs is because they're the ones where most of the uh, major uh, patented drug producers reside. Uh, and they're the ones that control the purse strings. It is up to them to decide what is the right mechanism. We simply recommended from our independent research what was the best. Uh, there were issues either way with prizes. What is needed is to shake up this world and for everybody to get out of their comfort zone, including policymakers and particularly including pharmaceutical companies, and start being incentivized or cajoled, and hence why the so-called pay or play option is under consideration, to do something about getting more drugs, which in itself, if it happens, would cause the VC world to start getting out of bed in the morning and focusing on this instead of spending the whole life on cancer research. Thank you very much.